it doesn't matter to me what the outside world sees. If you look at me, you've seen my page. If you look at me, I don't look like a yogi if you would just see me walking down the street. Uh, but that's the path that I'm on. And whether it looks normal to other people or not, that, that's not my concern. It's not up for, you know, it's not my responsibility to make people see who I am. It's just up to me to be who I am. That was DJ Townsell, and I'm Henry Winslow. You're listening to Dharma Talk. Dharma Talkers, thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the show. If you're new here, welcome. And if you're a longtime listener, thanks for dropping back in for another conscious conversation around yoga, purpose, and evolution. Before we dive in, I just released a 60-minute Hatha Vinyasa class just for you. This is a thoughtfully sequenced practice and masterfully shot and produced video to boot. And here's the kicker, it's free. If you have the Henry Yoga app, it's already been dropped right into the extras section. And if not, just head over to henryyoga.com slash masterclass and you'll be able to access it for free online. Please join us in our mission to spread this practice far and wide by sharing with your friends and community. Once again, that's henryyoga.com slash masterclass. Please check it out and have a great practice. Okay. Eventually, we all get to the point where we question ourselves. We've all been there, right? Maybe one unexpected downturn or a sequence of unfortunate events yanks us down a death spiral of regret, confusion, uncertainty, and negative self-talk. And this is where we sometimes are at our most vulnerable to outside influence, for better or for worse. When we lack confidence, we feel lost or even helpless, and we look to answers elsewhere, outside of ourselves. Well, my friend and this week's guest, DJ, is here to remind you that it is never your responsibility to answer to anyone else, to convince anyone else, to please anyone else when it comes to living your life. Only you can make the profound decisions that can change the trajectory of your life because you are the one who will live with the consequences. Your only responsibility is to be who you are. As a former NFL athlete, wide receiver, turned international yoga teacher, DJ knows a thing or two about defying onlookers' expectations. And in this episode, we talk about embracing one's competitive nature, standing in one's own power and personal strength, irrespective of what others think, and being a pillar of inspiration for others, especially those who may feel like outsiders, such that they have permission to make the unexpected choices that support them. All that coming right up, but first let's take a moment to thank our sponsors. This episode is brought to you in part by Yoga East Austin. Coming up in May is an event I'm certainly looking forward to because it's gonna be a first. In May, I'll be heading back to Yoga East Austin in Texas, this time to practice yoga with Anna Forrest and Jose Calarco. Anna and Jose were previous guests on the show and one of my favorite interviews of 2019. I enjoyed speaking with them about how they have integrated music and ceremony into their yoga classes and workshops, but mostly Anna's approach to using expansive and pinpoint breathing to heal specific areas of trauma. Her system of yoga, coupled with Jose's passion for music and ceremony, set an intention, or as Jose would say, an invocation, for a nurturing and spiritual practice. Many of my favorite teachers and peers, even past guests on the show like Jared McCann and Benjamin Sears, have all attributed much of their growth to the time they spent learning from Anna. I know even today parts of my practice are bits and pieces of wisdom Anna has taught to someone that I have in turn learned from. I am super stoked to be with the transcendent and legendary Anna and Jose on May 8th through 10th, back with my friends at Yoga East Austin. Spots are filling quick, so be sure to check out yogaeastaustin.com slash forestyoga and use promo code HENRYWINS to save on all four workshops Anna and Jose are teaching. Once again, that's yogaeastaustin.com slash F-O-R-R-E-S-T-Y-O-G-A and use promo code HENRYWINS. 
This episode is brought to you in part by Warrior Bridge NYC. Warrior Bridge is an interdisciplinary movement studio in downtown Manhattan, offering classes in yoga, acro yoga, handstands, and flexibility training. Their classes are skillfully designed, featuring anatomy-informed warm-ups and progressions, drawing from and blending different yoga and movement modalities. While the offerings are diverse, what's constant is an emphasis on practicing in a way that honors where you're coming from and where you're trying to go. Warrior Bridge offers a full schedule of weekly classes, weekend workshops with visiting instructors, and teacher training programs, the next wave of which will be held this summer in NYC. First up, anatomy and movement teacher training from July 15th to 25th, led by Sean Langhouse and Emily Lazinski. Sean was a past guest on Dharma Talk, of course. This training is designed for both practicing and aspiring teachers who want to better understand anatomy and how the body works, as well as Warrior Bridge's unique training methodology around yoga, handstand, flexibility training, prehab, and injury prevention. And the next training will be their Acro Warrior Teacher Training from July 27th to August 6th. This is New York City's only Acro Yoga Teacher Training and is all about immersing yourself in the Acro practice and acquiring the skills to safely and intelligently lead Acro Yoga classes and practice. Learn more and register at warriorbridge.com. All right, back to the show. Introducing my guest this week, Derek DJ Townsell at Dade to Shelby on Instagram, is a former NFL athlete and currently an Orlando-based yoga teacher, health coach, and personal trainer. DJ recently competed on season one of NBC's The Titan Games with Dwayne The Rock Johnson, where much to his modest embarrassment, DJ was introduced as a, quote, yoga master. By sharing his journey and practice openly and enthusiastically, He inspires countless individuals worldwide, especially men and people of color, to take up a yoga practice for its physical, mental, and spiritual benefits. If this episode speaks to you and you'd like to know more about DJ, then go to dharmatalk.show and type DJ in the search bar. And there you'll find all the notes, highlights with timestamps, and links for this episode. And by the way, if you're looking for something to read, check out my running list of every book ever recommended on Dharma Talk. We get one each week. And that's at henrywins.com slash books. So go there and pick out your next read. Without further ado, please enjoy my interview with DJ Townsell. DJ, my new friend, how are you? I'm so excited you're on the podcast. What's up? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's nice getting to... um, getting to hear your voice for the first time after following you online and, and seeing your voice come out um, in, in type. So uh, <laughs> it's cool to get to meet you a little bit more intimately today, this morning. Nice to meet you, man. We always start with the same same opening question. So I want to give that one to you right now. Mm-hmm. What does the word Dharma mean to you? And what is your Dharma as you understand it today? Um, dharma simply means purpose to me. And I, I, say that every time anybody asks me about it or I mention it in classes and it's pretty much just following your path. There's a path that we're already on. It may deviate. It may have obstacles, but as long as you stay true to yourself, stay true to what you know is right in your mind and what you think you should be doing, you know, for yourself and for the world, then you're on the right track. So it's just following your path. And Mm -hmm. the funny thing is, uh, being as you know, former uh, former professional athlete, now personal trainer, now yogi, uh, my path has taken a lot of turns. But I one thing I always do is make sure I stay true to myself, not um, you know selling myself short or you know um, selling my soul for for any amount of money or any opportunity. If it's not true to me, then I'm not doing it. Yeah, that's that's great, and you know I also. I have similar kind of, you know, maybe everybody does, but I feel that I also have a similar kind of experience where it seems like I've gone and done completely different things Mm -hmm. and there's a deviation there, but how do you know, you know, how do you know that you're staying true to yourself when from the outside, maybe it looks like you're doing something completely different. I think sometimes it's, it's difficult when someone else tells you like, are are you sure you want to do that? Are you sure you want to make this drastic change? Have you, have you dealt with that? Absolutely. And my thing is, I don't let outside sources dictate my path. 
So going from the NFL, you would think like, hey, you need to continue playing football. And I've had people say that like, hey, wouldn't you, don't you miss it? Don't you want to go back? It's like, in a way, football opened the door to me becoming a trainer, me becoming a yogi. Um, tragic events that happened in my life to my family and stuff like that, that is what opened the door to me wanting to become a yoga instructor. So it doesn't matter to me what the outside world sees. If you look at me, you've seen my page. If you look at me, I don't look like a yogi if you would just see me walking down the street. Uh, but that's the path that I'm on. And whether it looks normal to other people or not, that, that's not my concern. It's not up for, you know, it's not my responsibility to make people see who I am. It's just up to me to be who I am. Nice. Yeah. But what about internally? Like, has it always been very clear to you when you've made drastic changes? Like, let's go back in time. When <laughs> you, you know, when you were it in professional football, you played in NFL, you played in other leagues as well, I, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, what was like, what happened that made you want to change your life and do something different? Um, well, it's a funny thing. Cause, uh, some, we use uh, the phrase NFL stands for not for long, which is very true in <laughs> most cases. So, you know, I was somebody who, I, it, I mean, it was my dream to play in the NFL, but once you get there, you realize in, in a lot of, cases it's not all it's cracked up to be unless you're a five-star recruit or you know a, a first round draft pick it doesn't always look like it's going to be you know a very long career and it wasn't for me I only played for a year and a half played a couple years in smaller leagues in a, I mean, uh, arena football Canadian football league and you know it there was a moment where I realized like I have a daughter to take care of I have bills to pay I have you know, dreams and aspirations that I want to go on with. I can't sit here and try to chase the NFL all my life or try to get back to that or try to play in a league where I'm going to get the same amount of exposure. It was like, what am I passionate about? Football was something that I was good at, but I wasn't necessarily passionate about it. What I was passionate about is was helping people and whether that was physically or mentally or giving advice and, you know, personal training was something that you know, I, I love working out. I was very, I'm a very athletic person. So my, my natural transition was, I love helping people. I love working out. Let me help people, you know, discover themselves through fitness and then, you know, eventually through yoga. So to me, it was a natural transition. It may not have looked that way or felt that way, but it was kind of natural in its, you know, in its formation. Yeah. So what was your first, first exposure to yoga? Was that through um, like complement to physical training? No, actually, I started doing yoga while I was in the Arena Football League. So okay. if you're familiar with Arena Football, it's very close quarters. It's not a wide open field. You got walls on all four sides. So there's a lot of impact. You're either going to get hit by another person, you're going to get hit into the wall, or you're going to hit this hard ass, whatever. I, I hope they don't call it turf, but it's pretty much like carpet. So oh. Yeah, you're playing on that. You know you're going to get hurt or not hurt, but you know you're going to get hit. And, you know, in a lot of cases you get hurt. So my remedy to that was finding a practice that can help me kind of uh, avoid injuries like that, staying limber, staying, you know, flexible, keeping my range of motion good so that if anything like that were to happen, my body wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't feel like a car crash. So I started doing yoga and I actually started on YouTube started doing 20 minute classes a day for about six months. And I'm a very, I'm a very free flowing person, but I also like structure. So I, and it's more so I like to give myself structure. I don't like being given structure by somebody else. So my regimen was to do 20 minutes a day for six months, see how my body feels. And then around that six month period, I started to kind of take what I've learned from these beginner yoga videos and format it into what I needed. So I started to form my own practice and do flows that were, you know, specific to my needs. Right. Right. You had, you'd exposed yourself enough to be able to know kind of what the building blocks were. Absolutely. And then you could personalize it to yourself. Exactly. And you had very personalized needs at that point, you know, not the, <laughs> the average person taking a yoga class on YouTube for 20 minutes probably isn't dealing with injury prehab and rehab from arena football. Absolutely. And this was years like since high school of, you know, tight hips and tight hamstrings and quads and, 
you know, in some cases, like when I was 19, I had, um, I had a misaligned hip. So I would get back spasms like crazy. It would feel like somebody was like driving a knife into my lower back. So I was dealing with that and, you know, neck stiffness and it's, you know, being a professional athlete isn't all it's cracked up to be physically. We may look the part, but it feels horrible. You feel like you're 70, 80 years old and you're only 25. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, you know, that it makes me think of like all the dancers mm-hmm. and like ex ballerinas who come into yoga class and they have these beautiful postures basically. Cause like their skills translate into yoga asana Absolutely. very easily. But the big difference is those practices, whether it's sports or aesthetic performance, like they're not geared around therapy. No. And a lot of the time they're sacrificing their feeling good in order yeah. to make the visual appearance or the performance, mm-hmm. whatever the case is. So what yeah. about you now? Like now that you're not playing football, do you, have you changed your practice? Like has it evolved over time? It's gotten more dynamic. So it wasn't so, you know, it wasn't so regimen based. It was now it's more when I need it. So now, you know, if I'm, I'll still work out and, you know, go about my day. But if it's a moment where I feel like I need to relax and, you know, let my body flow or even let my mind flow, then I'll pull the mat out and, and do a practice. Um, and, you know, just go with what I need and what my mind needs. So sometimes I'll do 15 minutes of sun salutations. I'll do 15 minutes of, you know, flowing with inversions or I'll do, you know, an hour. Just I just go with what I need, how I feel. What is your philosophy on, on teaching? Because if you're leading a class, it's obviously like a different, um, you, you can't be so responsive to your own needs necessarily. Mm-hmm. Not at all. And sometimes I go off of how I'm feeling and hope that somebody or, you know, a few people and in rare cases, the entire class is, you know, needing the same thing I'm needing, but I kind of keep it very universal and, you know, touch on different asanas here and there or different types of flows or different tempos here and there. But, you know, it's, and eventually something that's happening off the mat for somebody is going to translate onto the mat. So it, it, in a way it kind of organically brings itself all together where we're, you know, on the same page. And I would like to say that's, you know, you know, um, a testament to how I create a space for people. Nice. Well, um, something else that I've noticed about you, you know, just from what I've seen online is that you are very uh, vocal and transparent about what's going on in your in your relationship. And I think that Mm. you and your partner are kind of like models to a lot of people. Mm. (laughs) Has has yoga been um, influential in, in the way that you treat the others in your lives, whether it's, you know, your partner or just generally speaking? Uh, yoga's a big, um, it's a big part of my life. So, you know, me and my partner, we do yoga together. A lot of our conversations that we have would sound like something out of a yoga class. <laughs> and <laughs> and that helps because it, it's, it, and we notice when there's some kind of, you know, there's a, a lacking somewhere. If we're not communicating well enough, we'll, you know, even if it's me going off on my own and doing a practice where I focus on my throat, uh, opening my throat chakra or, you know, anything like that. I try to bring yoga into every aspect of my life because in the physical sense, it's helped so much. Why wouldn't it help in the emotional and spiritual sense as well? So it's a big part of my relationship, my parenting, my friendships, my business relationships. So I try to bring that into everything that I can. It's kind of like somebody saying like, you know, um, religion is their driving force. Well, my religion in a way is yoga. So I try to keep that, uh, at the forefront. Well, I I had to kind of tread lightly there because I wasn't sure what your, um, I wasn't totally sure what your perspective on yoga was, whether you kept it mostly physical or if you extended beyond that, because like I told you before we started the recording, like I first saw you commenting on a yoga, yogi memes post (laughs) and you were like cracking jokes at the people with the crystals and like just being totally esoteric and Mm -hmm. ungrounded. But I know you're just giving them a hard time too. No, absolutely. And I just like having, I'm a very fun loving person. I'm a very humorous person. I can be sarcastic at times. And when you're on a page, like, uh, you know, our friend Pedro's Yogi memes, it's a fun page. So anything that I comment on there is going to be 
you know, based on humor or based on, you know, the love, the funny trends that we see. And it's just poking jokes. But if somebody really feels offended by that, then it's like, okay, I must, you must be one of these people that do this. So, you know, it's, don't be mad at me. <laughs> We're just having fun. Yeah. And I, um, it's, it's kind of a, you know, you have to tread lightly as well with that because you don't, it's, we're in a very sensitive society where, you know, yes, we're yoga instructors. We're, you know, trying to create a space for people, but you also have to remember we're human. Uh, humor is part of being human. So I'm going to have fun and I'm going to crack jokes and I'm not going to do it in a, in a, um, a ma- malicious kind of way, but just having fun and keeping everything generalized. And if you, you know, if you have a, a, crystal infused water bottle, then, you know, just take the joke, have fun with it. Like you, you probably thought that this is going to look ridiculous when you bought it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Come on. You know that that's ridiculous. (laughs) This episode is sponsored by crystal infused water. bottle. (laughs) I thought you were actually doing a commercial. (laughs) Uh, Use the offer code Rasta Yogi and get 20% off. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Hey, so, um, you know, the other thing that you did before, or I'm not sure if it was before or after getting into yoga is, uh, you were on the NBC show, the Titan games mm-hmm. with, with the rock. Yeah. Tell me about that. Like how, how did that become an opportunity for you? And what was it like? Um, actually their producers, one of the producers who's a yoga instructor, uh, had been following me for a while and reached out to me. I was like, hey, you know, uh, we're doing this show. It's uh, we're trying to find people who would be right for this show. You know, as far as the casting, and you know, The Rock's going to be the host. And I've been offered, you know, opportunities to audition for TV shows before, but when it was like The Rock, I was like, ah, get out of here! Like this isn't real. And then literally the next day, I see that The Rock posted about it. So I go back and I'm like, okay, I'm down. Let's let's see what this is like. The one thing that I was adamant about was I don't want to be on a show where you got to live in a house with people and, you know, it's going to be, you know, fighting and, you know, the whole reality TV type thing. So they were, they, you know, reassured me that that's not what this is about. This is about highlighting your story and what you do for the world and showing your athletic ability. And, you know, this is not going to be some strong man competition. We want the challenges to be very athletic and, you know, you have to think your way through things. So I w- once they said that, I was all in. But as a whole, it was an amazing experience. The only thing that I didn't like was shooting at night. So we would be on set from 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. That sucks because I hate being up at night. I need my sleep. But other than that, it was amazing. The Rock, I've, I've, no, I've been watching The Rock. So I'm from Miami. So The Rock played at the University of Miami. I was watching him play football when I was three. So from that to... You know, WWE and SmackDown and then, you know, the movies and stuff. It was just like, oh, shoot, I've really been, you know, keeping track of this guy since I was three years old. So it was. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's another example of somebody who has like he's taken twists and turns mm-hmm. in his path. And, you know, you don't make it that far and have the staying power that he does if you're not true to yourself. Exactly. That's a really inspiring and guy. When you meet him in person, it's you for for a split second you forget that you're talking to the rock because he's like somebody who's genuinely interested in the person he's talking to. So he'll ask you questions about yourself, ask you, you know, if he knows information about you, he'll ask about that. So it's like, damn, like you, it's it's almost like you feel like the celebrity for a second. And you're like, I need to ask so many questions I want to ask him, but he won't let me ask him because he's so, you know, concerned about getting to know me. So he's a very down to earth guy. And like, it was a pleasure meeting him. He should do a podcast. Maybe he already has one. Does he have a podcast? I don't know. He would be a good host. I'm, with all the movies he's doing, he's, he probably does not have any time to do podcasts. He's probably not. <laughs> his movies are his podcast. He comes out every yeah. week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's on a regular content schedule for sure. <laughs> Why was the filming done in the middle of the night? Because, um, well, it, this is my interpretation of it. I don't, this is not even what they told me, but I figured that you know, if there was sunlight out, it'd be very hard to manipulate lighting. So when it's nighttime, the sun's down, you can use whatever lights you want. You can get the perfect angles with the perfect lighting. And they had like, oh my God, like a dozen, maybe two or three dozen cameras out there. So they were catching every angle. So I guess like if you have sunlight out with the sun setting or the sun's rising, whatever it may be, you're going to get some kind of, you know, 
manipulation with the light that you don't want. Mm-hmm. So with the, yeah, with the nighttime, they can control everything that they see. Yeah. And so were, were they right about the promise that it was not going to be a dramatic, like pitting of one character against another? Oh, absolutely. Like a, like a were, real world road rules. It was, it was perfect. Like it was, we all stayed in the hotel, had our own room. So you weren't like forced to stay with somebody. And with that, just naturally people started to gravitate towards each other and form friendships. There's people who played, I mean, who was, uh, competed that I'm still friends with today. We talk all the time and, you know, have conversations, you know, what you up to, what are you up to these days? And we have like group chats. So like when the, they announced the second season, there was like a giant group chat, people asking like, Hey, who's competing this time around or, you know, whatever it may be. So it's become a small fa- or like a, like a fraternity where like we started this thing. So let's keep in touch. Would you ever want to do something like that again? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it was too soon for me to do season two. <laughs> yeah. It was like, I need a break. Maybe I'll do like Return of the Champions or something. I, I would be 100% down for that. So what, what about it was, um, was so appealing? Like, did you, did you face challenges within yourself during it and overcome them? Or did you mostly like the connections that you made? What about it did you like? It was, so I'm, I have a competitive nature about me still to this day, just because of, you know, playing football and baseball and basketball. So that competitive nature is still in me. So naturally I want to like go out and show that, you know, I still got it. I'm not that old, <laughs> but the challenges that they, they didn't give us the challenges until the day we, you know, filmed. So we didn't know what we were doing, but you know, just the promise that, you know, it's going to be mental and physical. So the things that we're doing, there's going to be some, you know, physical uh, strain there, but also you're going to be tested mentally. And I love that part. And it's reminiscent of yoga where, you know, sure. you're trying to do handstands and you think it's all physical, but then you realize like, I'm way too in my head right now. Let me just take a step back and relax. And then you nail a handstand. Okay. So when was this and were you already practicing yoga? Oh, this was, we shot this last, well, 2018, September, 2018. And yeah, I was, I was waist deep in yoga. Oh, okay. Then. Yeah. So I think, yeah, they, nice. and the, okay. <laughs> they actually introduced me as yoga master on there. I was like, ah, don't call me that. <laughs> <laughs> yoga Acharya. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like ah, I'm not a master, not even close. That's like, that's something that people outside of the yoga community say only pretty yeah, much. They're like they, and when they call you guru, I'm like, no, stop it. Please. No, <laughs> I'm not even, nowhere near that. <laughs> yeah. That's, that sounds cool. So did, I mean, they always create sort of characters around the people who are in these reality shows. Was that something that like they continue to edit into your story, like focus on your yoga? Yeah, that, I mean, and that was the main thing that they wanted to talk about. So, of course, former NFL, you know, yoga instructor or former NFL turned yoga instructor. So that was the thing that they wanted to focus on. So I was OK with that. And they didn't over exaggerate or do anything that I wouldn't have said. Uh, I wouldn't have called myself a yoga master, but the story they stayed tr- pretty true to. So I was satisfied with how they presented me. What was, what were the challenges like? Like, give me an example of one of them. Okay. So my first challenge was, it was called a vortex. So you're standing on this platform with these chains. Um, it's pretty much like you're standing in a giant gear and you're standing in the middle. There's two chains on both sides of you. You pretty much have to row the chains And as you're doing that, the chains are lifting a giant net out on the arena floor in front of you. So the net is about 30 feet high. Once you lift it all the way up, the gate in front of you falls down and you have to go climb that net. So by this time, you're rowing chains. So your forearms and your shoulders are shot. And then you have to go climb it to ring this this bell. So stuff like that, where it's like, it's very physically challenging, but it's also mental because now you have to think, how am I going to get up this net, this cargo net after I just used up every ounce of energy I have in my body. So you have to overcome that mental struggle to, you know, get back into the physical and just be an athlete. Definitely. Most, most definitely willpower and determination there. Absolutely. Was the rock participating? Or just watching and laughing? Uh, he was, so he was the the host of it. So he was pretty much yeah. over to the side on the platform where they film him. And, you know, he 
does his intro for you and the other contestant. And then he gives this inspirational, like, you know, word. And then he announces the the challenge that we're doing. And then pretty much a cannon goes off and you just take off running. So you're like standing okay. there with a crowd of people screaming and you hear the rock talking on, over the microphone. You hear him say your name. You're like, dude, the rock just said my name. And then a cannon goes off and you got to get back into like athlete mode. <laughs> So it's like Crazy. a bunch of different thoughts and emotions going on. And then you have to like knock all of that to the side and get back into being an athlete and thinking your way through this challenge. Yeah. Wow. And then, and then at the same time you realize like, damn, the rock is like watching me from like 20 feet away right now. I know. I'm sure that gives you a boost though. <laughs> it did. It gave me a boost. I'm used to performing under pressure with, you know, I've played in arenas where there's 70,000 people screaming and, but in, you know, so it was kind of natural to me. So I just pretty much zoned out. And and that's when I actually brought yoga into the challenges because I would do like a Ujjayi breath, you know, before the cannon goes off. So I wasn't, you know, too overzealous or, you know, just rushing with emotion and not thinking. So I would like come back to myself and, you know, bring myself back into my, my body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. Using yoga. <laughs> exactly. <or> unusual circumstances. <laughs> A little while earlier, you, you mentioned, you said kind of casually, like, I don't look like a yogi. Mm -hmm. And I know that you don't really, you said before already, like, you don't place importance on what other people think about mm -hmm. you. You stay true to yourself. That's an important, um, basically, like, philosophical tenet or value of yours mm -hmm. that's kept you on your path, on your dharma. But has it ever been a factor for you that people think you don't look the part? Like, has that ever caused you struggle or conflict in any way? It hasn't caused me struggle, but I've seen people who have, who didn't think that what I'm doing is a possibility for them because, you know, they're the only black person in a yoga class or, you know, they look a certain way. Okay. So they kind of, I maybe make people in a yoga class feel uncomfortable. Whereas like I started, you know, in my own space, in my living room. So I didn't have to worry about how I made other people feel. And by the time I got deep enough into my yoga practice where I wanted to, you know, go to a class or go to Wanderlust or anything like that, it was like, I'm very, I'm as much a yogi as anybody else. So I don't care if, you know, I don't look like the prototypical yogi. Like I'm very much in this practice too. And this is a, a lifelong practice that I've committed to. So they're just going to have to take it as it is. Mm hmm yeah, I mean, that that goes a long way, the confidence of having a practice and feeling like rooted in what you're doing. Yeah, and I, I, get, I, get totally I get people understand who, why. I get people who go through yeah. that all the time, whether it's their skin color or, you know, their size or, you know, whatever it may be. And I tell them, like, just go and enjoy. Like, don't worry about what's outside of your mat. Like, pretty much put four walls up around your mat and that's your space. That's what a yoga class should be. It should be a space for you, whether that space is your living room or whether it's in a yoga class and it's your four sides of the mat, like enjoy the space you're in, feel secure in the space you're in. That's a good message. Yeah. And, and now the, it's kind of come full circle cause you have classes online too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, I have classes. If you go to my website, day to shelby.net, I have online classes with different companies and, you know, teaching retreats and yoga classes. I'm actually about to go on tour soon around the U S and I have, an upcoming retreat in Egypt in May. So just making sure that I do the same thing that I tell people to keep in mind. Like I'm trying to create a space for everybody to feel comfortable and, you know, make sure that they get the most out of my teaching and also the most out of the time that they took to step onto that mat. Mm -hmm. Nice. Have you ever been to Egypt before? I have not. And I'm so excited. <laughs> Yeah, I've never been there before either, but that's cool that you're going there and, and leading the retreat because it kind of levels the playing field for everyone. If, if there's any concern that like you're an outsider and you don't belong, well, hey, you're there. You've never even been there before. Exactly. You're going to look different. Everybody's going to look different. And sometimes to get out of your comfortable external circumstances is just what the doctor ordered. No, absolutely. I, I try to throw myself out of my comfort zone as much as possible. And I feel like that's the only place where you find growth. So there's people who've been on my retreats. I did a retreat uh, last year in Peru. And there were a couple of people who came who had never done yoga before. Their first taste of yoga wow. was my retreat. 
and they threw themselves out the outside of their comfort zone and they actually are coming to Egypt as well. So amazing. It's, yeah. It's, I just tell people like step outside of your comfort zone. If you, if you're interested in something or something appeals to you and also causes you fear, like if, you, if you're fearful, fearful and excited about it at the same time, you should be doing that. Yeah. So traveling was traveling wasn't a fear of mine, more so teaching in different areas that kind of like frightened me a little bit because, you know, as a yoga instructor, we all have those moments where we're like, you know, I'm, what if I say this wrong or what if I, you know, can't get this message across or what if I mess up one of the one of the poses or asanas? You know, what if somebody who comes to my class only, you know, speaks in Sanskrit? Do is, Does it make me less of a yoga instructor? It's like, just step outside of that. Step outside of that. Do it, do it your way and focus on just helping the people who came. Absolutely. And they, they come for your specific instruction. So I, that's what I remind myself for, of is like, if they didn't want to be here, they wouldn't have come thousands of miles to take this retreat with me. So I just make sure that I, you know, keep myself grounded and give them the best possible experience that, that they can. And for the most part, when they come on retreats, they end up forming friendships the day that they get there. So it's like, oh, that makes my job easier. I don't have to. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to make sure you everybody's have to okay. No. <laughs> and no, it's it was it's amazing because like in Peru, uh, one of the ladies who came on the retreat, her flight was delayed, so she actually got there a day later than everybody else did. And by that time, they had already been speaking on uh, WhatsApp and messaging each other, so they already knew like our hat were kind of familiar with each other by then. So, you know, they're looking for this person and it's like, Oh, their flight's delayed. Well, all of us as a group sat in the, in the living room of our, of the villa we stayed in and waited for her to walk through the door. And that just shows that, you know, whether you know somebody for years or have just met them 10 minutes ago or only talked to them on WhatsApp, there's a connection that comes with this practice where it's like it, you, you yeah. start to inherit a family as you, delve deeper into yourself. What do you think that is? Like why why is practicing together so fast and efficient in bringing people together like that? It's I mean, it's a sense of camaraderie and humanity. It's like we all do these things and you ever had like that that uh that thought like you're doing something you're like I wonder if people do this sometimes too and it's kind of like a some weird thing that you think only you do and it's like no, there's actually a community of people out there who do that. Well, when you start yeah. to there's a whole facebook group for that <laughs> like they meet up on tuesday nights at 10 o'clock but um no once you start to really get into the practice you realize like you know there's people who think these these amazing thoughts and you know you there's people who have astral projected before so it's like damn like there is a community out there and they're very welcoming so you know it's just that sense of family and you know camaraderie that we all strive for yeah yeah. And it, you said that people come for your instruction, but they come for your instruction. They also come for your attitude, your personality, mm -hmm. your energy. And I think that also contributes to the ability of people to connect very quickly. No, absolutely. And that just, that makes me feel blessed that people have invested their time and their energy into what I have to say or what I do or what I present to the world. And it's just, you know, it, it's rewarding in, in and of itself. So that just, I mean, that, that shows me that my dharma is, you know, in place right now and I'm on the right path. Nice. How did you land on Peru and Egypt? Um, I actually wanted to go to Peru since third grade for some reason, an eight-year-old that wants to go to Peru and <laughs> never thought that I would get there and definitely didn't think that yoga would be the catalyst to me getting there, but I've always, you know, been intrigued with Machu Picchu. Like I was, I don't know why I was in third grade, like wanting to go to Machu Picchu and, you know, in high school and you no know, middle and high school, like interested in pharaohs and Egyptian architecture. And, you know, I'm a very, I'm a nerd. So I'm, I love learning about history wow. and witnessing history and, you know, interacting with okay. history. <laughs> it's, the, it's the ancient civilization connection. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I love that stuff too. I've never been to either of those places, but they're both high on my list also. Yeah. Maybe next time I'll go with you. You should. We had, I, let's go. What is it? May 25th. That's your Egypt yeah. retreat. <laughs> okay. Let's see if I can start manifesting this. Let's go. 
we need to get some <laughs> we need to get some sponsorships going on so we can get you there. I know we need the crystal um <laughs> water bottle to three hundred dollars three hundred dollars a bottle. <laughs> hey, come on, come on, guys. I need your help here. Oh man. Um, okay, give me one more one more story, DJ, because you have been like you've had so much success in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. I want to know one um, major win that you've had, whether it was in your football career, whether it was on the uh, the Titan Games, or in your more recent yoga career teaching, something that reaffirmed your conviction in your path and that you're doing your part to live your dharma. Oh man. Um... Honestly, what we just talked about, me having the opportunity to travel and see the world and teach, um, I'll give you a quick story. So my uncle was a very influential uh, science teacher in Atlanta, and he passed away in 2014. And and just seeing what he did for people and how he helped people, and one of the things he did, you know, in his personal life and also professional life was he stepped foot on all seven continents. So when he passed- Including Antarctica. Including Antarctica, he actually dove. Oh. Head, he actually dove head first into the Arctic Ocean. No kidding. Yeah, Dude, so, move over, Wim Hof. <laughs> <laughs> so the, he was a he was a big inspiration for me, and um, he was like a second father to me. So when he passed, that like devastated me, but it also motivated me to become a teacher, not necessarily a school teacher like he was, because I can I also come from the era where like you know you can get hit by your teacher if you act it up. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I, I don't, I don't want to be on the news, you know, cause I yoked up somebody's child, but yeah. um, I was like, what way can I spread my message and what I know and my experiences with the world? And that's when I started my yoga teacher training and, you know, also being able to, to, um, to travel. So being able to go to Europe and Sri Lanka and Peru and now Egypt is just, that's been a blessing. And so that's one of my um, one of my bucket list items is since he stepped foot on all seven continents, I want to handstand on all seven continents. Oh, uh, there you so go. Africa is going to be the next one. <laughs> nice. nice. So I have. What's, so give me your bucket list of of travel destinations. So first thing is to handstand on all seven continents. So right now the last three are Africa, Australia, and Antarctica. And then um, okay. the next thing is just seeing different places that I've always been in love with, like Venice and Sydney and Japan and uh, what's another one? Brazil. Um, I'm trying to think of places that I really would love to go. Rome. And mostly that's from also being um, an art major. I'm fascinated with like architecture and paintings and, you know, uh, antiquity. So I'm just, I want to see where all these things were created. Yeah, Italy is a really good place for that. I just yes. got back from there. I was oh, in man. Florence and Milan. And yeah, there's a lot of beautiful Renaissance art to see. I, I, I and and more see and older than that also. I know. <laughs> I have to see it. Very good. Okay. Um, DJ, I think now is a good time to start uh, wrapping things up. Mm-hmm. So I want to close off the interview with what I call the prana round. Okay. And this is where I ask you six rapid fire questions Uh-oh. and you answer in minimum one word, maximum one sentence. Okay. okay. All right, here we go. Question one in one word. Why do you practice yoga? Uh, transcendence. Good word. What is your favorite yoga pose and why? Scorpion handstand because it's the perfect, um, it's the perfect culmination of strength, flexibility, focus, and breath. Nice. I did not expect you to say handstand scorpion. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm, I'm a big fan of handstand scorpion. Myself. That's my favorite. Okay. What is the single best cue or piece of advice you've ever received from a yoga teacher? Um, and as a student or as a teacher? Either. Yeah, it could be like a mentor for you. Yeah, so the best thing, the best piece of advice that I got early in my teaching career was to learn how to learn how to teach off the mat. And so what does I that used, mean? So I used to, when I would teach a class, I would stay on the mat and, you know, go through the class to make sure I didn't forget anything or make sure I got both sides. And then my friend, you know, who actually took my class once, he took me over to the side and was like, learn how to teach off the mat. 
So he's like ever so oh, like walking he, around the room, yeah, walking around the room, you know, like, you know what you're trying to do in your head. So don't worry about what you're like. You don't have to do it with your body to remember it. So just, you know, create that space and create that space for yourself where you feel comfortable enough to step off the mat and walk around the room. And, and once I started doing it, I realized how hard it was, but also once you are comfortable in your, your teachings and in the space that you've created, that you can do that pretty easily. So now I can almost not be looking at the class whatsoever and teach the class and know that they're on the right cue and they're, you know, on the right breath and everything. Yeah. And the irony is once you are off the mat, you actually can see the class even better. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Much better, actually. <laughs> All right. Recommend one book and it can be modern or ancient for our listeners. The Celestine Prophecy. Ah, that's a good one. That's one of my favorites ever. That actually Is it op- J- that James, James Redfield? Redfield. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That actually opened my eyes into seeing and feeling energy from, you know, plants, animals, other people, how I interact with people, try not to insert too much of my power when it's not needed. So it helps a lot. Yeah. And you don't even need a crystal water bottle. <laughs> Back to the water bottles. <laughs> Y'all not gonna let me live this down. <laughs> All right. Is, is yoga for everyone? Yoga is for everyone. Last question for you, DJ. How can our audience get in touch with you and how can we support you in your Dharma? Um, well, my website is Dade, D-A-D-E, the number two. Shelby, S-H-E-L-B-Y dot net. Uh, my Instagram and my Facebook are day to Shelby. And um, you can support me just by, uh, I don't know, whether you join a class or come on a retreat or just like a picture or tell me, you know, say, hey, whatever. It doesn't matter. As long as you, as long as I, my, my whole thing with my Dharma is as long as I inspire one person, and that could be past, present, or future, then I've done my part. Awesome. Good words. Good good words, my friend. Thank you so much. Th- thank you for taking the time to chat with me. Um, and I wish you the best with your travels. I think you're going to nail the handstand on seven right. continents in no time. <laughs> I truly appreciate it, man. Thank you. Dharma Talkers, I hope you enjoyed listening to that conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. And if you did, please share it. Take a screenshot, share it on Instagram, and tag me, at Henry Wins. I love hearing from you about the conversations that make an impact for you. We have the ability to shape the world through our thoughts, words, and conversation. So let's influence the collective consciousness together. All my gratitude to Rory Wagstaff of Ease of Mind Productions for keeping our audio crisp and operations smooth, and to Patrick Kiebzak of Momentology Music and Art for supplying the powerful soundtrack to these conversations. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review, and tune in to new episodes of Dharma Talk every Thursday. I'll speak to you next week, and until then, keep living your Dharma.